It's often said that a spinner is like the square root of a vector, and I'll say that's kind of true, but slightly inaccurate. If you're thinking of taking an actual square root of a vector and getting a spinner, that's not correct. What is true is that we can take a 3D vector and cut up the vector into two pieces called poly spinners. So it's better to say that a 3D vector can be factored into a column spinner and a row spinner. We're continuing with our introduction to spinners in 3D from a mathematical point of view. In the last video, we introduced the sigma matrices, also called the poly matrices. We found that if we wrote a vector using the sigma matrices as basis vectors, we ended up with a 2x2 two two matrix called a poly vector, which is an alternative way of writing a 3D vector. Just as we can take certain 2x2 two two matrices and write them as a column times a row, it's also possible to take this 2x2 two two poly vector and write it as a column times a row. This column and row are called poly spinners. Unlike traditional 3D vectors, which rotate with a single 3x3 three three matrix, poly vectors are rotated with a double sided transformation using special matrices called SU2 matrices. If we factor our poly vector into a pair of poly spinners, then each spinner only transforms with a single SU2 matrix. This explains why spinners rotate half as much as vectors do. Before we start looking at spinners, let's review basic 2x2 matrices. Using array multiplication, we can multiply a column by a row to get a 2x2 matrix. We just arrange them like this and follow the standard rules of array multiplication. 1 times 3 equals 3, 1 times 2 equals 2, negative 4 times 3 equals negative 12, and negative 4 times 2 equals negative 8. Now, it's also possible to do this process in reverse. Given this 2x2 two two matrix, we can ask how to break it up into a column times a row. You can think of this as trying to solve for these four variables a, b, c, d. If you like, you can pause and try to figure it out, but I'm going to give you the answer. One solution is the column 1, 4 and the row 1, 100. However, there are actually multiple possible solutions to this problem. If we take our column row multiplication, we can put a number 1 in the middle without changing anything. We can then break up this number 1 into 2 times 1 half. Multiplying the column on the left by 2 gives us the components 2, 8. And multiplying the row on the right by 1 half gives us 1 half, 50. This gives us another solution which also reproduces the same matrix. In fact, we can multiply the column by any non-zero scaling factor s, and multiply the row by 1 over s and still get the same matrix, since the s and 1 over s will cancel with each other. So there are an infinite number of solutions to this problem of factoring a matrix into a column and a row. If we were to write this column as AB and the row as CD, we could feel free to multiply the column by 1 over A and multiply the row by A to get another valid solution. The resulting column has components 1, B over A. While there are multiple possible columns that can solve the factoring problem, the B over A ratio for all these columns is the same. So when factoring a matrix, we can get multiple possible columns, but there is only one unique B over A ratio that solves the factoring problem. So if you like, you can convert this factoring problem into a series of equations, and try solving for A, B, C, and D. Since there are an infinite number of solutions, you'll have to make a decision for what A should be before you solve for the rest of the variables. Now, I should point out that not all 2x2 two two matrices can be factored into a column and a row. For example, this matrix here, with the 400 changed to a 500, cannot be factored. If you try to search for ABCD numbers to solve this, 
you'll find that there are no solutions. The reason this first matrix can be factored is because the columns are all multiples of each other. Here, the first column multiplied by 100 gives the second column. Equivalently, the rows are all multiples of each other. The first row multiplied by 4 gives the second row. In the specific case of a 2x2 two two matrix, these conditions are the same thing as saying the determinant of the matrix is 0. With this other matrix, the columns are not multiples of each other, and the determinant is non-zero, so it cannot be factored into a column and a row. Now, if we bring back our poly vector, let's try factoring this poly vector into a row and a column. In other words, we need to solve for these A, B, C, D numbers. This gives us four equations. Now, let's keep a couple things in mind while we solve this. First, remember that there will be multiple solutions, because we can always multiply the column by a non-zero number s if we multiply the row by 1 over s. Also, in order for solutions to exist, the determinant of this matrix must be zero. Recall from the last video that the determinant of a poly vector is the vector's negative squared length the negative of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. When a vector has zero squared length, we call it an isotropic vector, or sometimes a null vector. Keep in mind that the only way this vector can have zero squared length is if all the components are zero, or if at least some of the components are complex numbers. Getting back to factoring the poly vector, since the squared length must be zero, we must have z squared equals negative x squared plus y squared. If we take the square root of both sides, we can pull the square root of negative one out in front as i. Now, technically, this square root could have either a plus sign or a minus sign in front, and it would still satisfy our original equation but these basically correspond to the two different cases of a positive z component and a negative z component. So I'm only going to look at the solutions with the plus sign in front of the square root. If you want the negative solutions, you just need to change the sign of the z component in the poly vector. If we look at our first component equation, z equals a times c, it would be useful if we could take our equation for z over here and factor the right-hand side into two parts. That way we can set one of them to a and set the other one to c. To do this, we're going to treat the expression under the square root sign as a difference of squares. It's true that this looks like a sum of squares, but we can turn a sum of squares into a difference of squares by changing the sign and including a factor of negative 1 here. And negative 1 is really i squared. And if we bring the i inside the same square as y, we now have a difference of squares. Remember, we can always factor a difference of squares into two terms. The left term involving the first variable minus the second variable and the right term involving the first variable plus the second variable. And for reasons of following convention, I'm going to move the i over here. So we've successfully written z as a product of two terms, and we can set these equal to a and c. Using our solutions for a and c, we can solve for b and d. b ends up being equal to negative c and d ends up being equal to a. So we've successfully factored our poly vector into a column and a row, and I'm going to call these two component objects poly spinners. And I'm going to rewrite our a and b components as the Greek letters xi1 and xi2 with upper indices. So just keep in mind that these are column indices and not exponents. They're just labels that indicate where the component belongs in the left column. I'm also going to mention that many sources include factors of 1 over the square root of 2 in these components.
and include a factor of 2 in front of the array multiplication to compensate for them. But I don't plan on doing that, so this is the solution we'll be using. So we've discovered a solution to the problem of factoring a poly vector into a column and a row. The components xi1 and xi2 are given in terms of x and y by these formulas. We can also solve for x, y, and z in terms of xi1 and xi2. Now of course there are multiple solutions for these xi components. We can always multiply the column spinner by a complex number with magnitude a and phase theta if we divide the row spinner by the same complex number. For example, we could always multiply the column spinner by 1 over xi1, giving us the components 1 and the ratio xi2 over xi1. So, while there are multiple possible column spinners that solve this factoring problem, for a given poly vector, the ratio xi2 over xi1 will be the same for all the solutions. This ratio is a single complex number. In the case of spinners with a ratio where the denominator is zero, these are related to the point at infinity, a concept from projective geometry I covered in video 5. This relates back to the two physical applications of spinners we discussed in videos 2 through 5, the polarization of light waves and quantum spin states. Light wave polarizations can be described by a pair of complex numbers, one for the horizontal polarization and one for the vertical polarization. The complex numbers tell us the amplitude and phase of each polarization. Overall scaling of the wave does not change the polarization, and overall phase factors just shifts the wave along the axis of travel without changing the polarization. So light wave polarizations are unchanged by overall multiplication by complex numbers. We also learned quantum spin states in the Stern-Gerlach experiment are described by a pair of complex numbers, one for the spin up probability amplitude and one for the spin down probability amplitude. The probability of state A collapsing onto state B is given by Born's rule. If we multiply state A by a complex number, the normalization in the denominator eliminates the scale factor, and the absolute value eliminates the phase factor, giving us the same probability result we originally had. So quantum states are unchanged by overall multiplication by complex numbers. So both light wave polarizations and quantum spin states are described by a pair of complex numbers, whose states are unaffected by overall complex number multiplication. In other words, it is only the ratio of their components that matters. This is similar to the poly spinners we've discovered in this video, where a given vector produces a unique ratio of poly spinner components. In mathematical terms, when several spinners have the same component ratio, we do consider them to be different spinners, but they are all associated with the same vector, so they can be grouped together in a kind of family. Recall from the last video that poly vectors rotate with double-sided SU2 transformations. Once we factor a poly vector into a pair of poly spinners, we see that each poly spinner rotates with a single SU2 matrix. The column spinner rotates with an SU2 matrix multiplied from the left, and the row spinner rotates with the same SU2 matrix but Hermitian conjugated and multiplied from the right. We also saw that spinners describing light wave polarizations and quantum spin states rotated with SU2 matrices on the Poincaré sphere and Bloch sphere. The reason SU2 matrices are able to rotate a spinner xi is that the spinner's squared magnitude is given by the Hermitian conjugate of xi times xi. When we transform xi using a unitary matrix U, we can flip these around and cancel U dagger and U to the identity matrix, 
since u is unitary. And this gives us the same squared magnitude for the spinner. So unitary matrices rotate spinners around without changing their length. Now we've learned how to factor a poly vector into a pair of poly spinners only if the vector's squared length is zero. This is called an isotropic vector or null vector. And either all the xyz components must be zero, or at least some of the xyz components must be complex. But what if the vector's components are all real and non-zero? Then it's impossible for the squared length to be zero. We can ask ourselves if it's still possible to factor this poly vector into spinners. It turns out that we can factor it into spinners if we use a trick. Let's go back to this matrix with components 1, 100, 4, 500. This matrix's determinant is non-zero, and so we can't factor it directly into a column and a row. However, we can write it as a sum of four matrices, one for each of the four components, where all the other components are zero. Then we can pull the numbers out in front as scaling factors so that the matrices are made up of only ones and zeros. Now, all of these four matrices now have determinants of zero, so they can be factored into a column and a row. For example, this matrix can be factored into the column 1, 0, and the row 1, 0. We can do something similar for the other matrices. So we've successfully decomposed this matrix into a sum of column row products. Even though we can't factor it directly into a single column and a single row, we can still express it as a sum of column row products. The same thing applies to poly vectors. When a poly vector's determinant is non-zero, we can't factor it directly into a column spinner row spinner product but we can break it apart and write it as a sum of column row products with different scaling factors in front. And these columns and rows are all poly spinners. When we rotate the vector using a double-sided SU2 transformation, the column spinners will all transform with an SU2 matrix on the left. And all the row spinners will transform with a Hermitian conjugated SU2 matrix on the right. So, to summarize the properties of poly spinners, they are pairs of complex numbers that we get when we factor a 3D poly vector into a column and a row. There are multiple solutions to this factoring problem, but there is a unique ratio of spinner components that solves the problem for a given vector. This factoring can only be done directly if the vector has zero squared length which means it's an isotropic vector, also called a null vector. For non-isotropic vectors, we can instead break the poly vector up into several matrices with zero determinants, and factor each one into a column spinner and a row spinner. Finally, while poly vectors rotate with a pair of SU2 matrices, one on each side, Column spinners and row spinners each rotate with a single SU2 matrix. As an exercise, you can try calculating the poly vector XYZ components for these poly spinners, and check if they make sense in relation to each other.